Hey everybody, it's Jessica DeMassa with WTF Health. What's the future health? I am talking to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation. And today, oh, we are double clicking on a big fundraise, $63 million in a series D to on-demand healthcare staffing company, Nomad. And here to tell us all about that, we have its co-founder and CEO, Alexi Nazem. Alexi, it's good to have you here. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Jess. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you. All right. So big fundraise for you guys. This is this brings your total to 113 million by my count. So a lot of money for Nomad, a lot of money for this digital marketplace that you guys have created for temporary healthcare jobs. And we want to hear all about that funding and how you are going to use it because you know your um, investors in this round. Very exciting. Uh, back again, the existing investors, but more importantly, led by Adams, which has a huge, like amazing pedigree of healthcare companies that they've invested in, including Village MD, Lyra Health, and Grand Rounds. But we, before we get to all that, I want to make sure that everybody understands what Nomad does. So, introduce us to Nomad. Tell us what you guys do. Sure. Yeah. Well, we are very excited about the opportunity to do more of what uh, what we do already. Um, so, Nomad is a company um, that's focused, as you said, on the healthcare sta healthcare staffing space. Um, as you know, there is a huge shortage of clinicians in the United States, even predating the the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. There's just an exploding demand for healthcare services, um, especially as the um, the population ages, the baby boom population ages. Um, and there isn't an equal growth in the supply of clinicians to take care of those uh, of those patients in need. And so this gap, which has persisted for many, many years, has just been getting worse and worse. And then, of course, exacerbated in this, in this last uh, couple of years with the pandemic. And um, that's the problem space that we're working in. Um, as I said, it's existed for a long time. So there's been companies that have been working towards fixing it, um, serving, you know, filling that gap with, uh, with temporary staffing. Um, and we've come in to, uh, to transform that market. Uh, about five years ago, uh, we launched our, our first product. And the, the idea is to build a marketplace to uh, do a technology-driven approach to getting clinicians to the bedside of patients who really need them, uh, where they're most needed, and being good about allocating those resources across the country. Um, and so we came into a market where everything was people powered. The traditional staffing agencies uh, accomplish this task of sourcing a candidate and putting them on staff at the bedside um, completely with people. Literally every task must be com completed by a human being. And that's, of course, not scalable. And that's why it's such a fragmented industry. There's over 2,500 staffing agencies. No one has achieved greater than 11, 12 percent market share um, because it's, it, you know, people powered businesses don't scale. So our, uh, our approach has been to uh, introduce that marketplace technology that has transformed so many other uh, uh, industries, um, like travel, for example, uh, with your Expedias and Airbnbs and things like that, and bring that technology, that sort of uh, concept to the healthcare staffing space, make it self-service, make it transparent, make it automated, make it easy to use. Um, and uh, and therefore drive down costs for the buy side, the hospital side, and increase pay for the clinicians um, while delivering better experience. And so um, the, that's basically what we do. We, okay. we try to do better, cheaper, faster staffing. I love that, and I want to I want to um, dive deep into some of that, especially around the business model here. But before I do, I want to clarify. So when you say clinicians, my understanding is is, is that it's nurses at this point. Is that right? Yes. Or you guys expanded yes. into other? So it's nurses that you are helping helping kind of fill in the, the gaps wherever they're needed. So if a health system or uh, an assisting living facility or uh, a behavioral health kind of facility needs a nurse, they could come to Nomad and, and easily find one to bring in from out of town. Is that right? That, that's exactly right. The reason I say clinicians is that our ambition is much greater. Oh, sure, uh, of course. <laughs> we, we aspire to address the entire healthcare workforce, but as with any startup that hopes to succeed, you have to win somewhere before you can win everywhere. And today um, we are focused on putting nurses in hospitals. Um, that's the, uh, that's the, you know, the core of our business. And uh, obviously over time, maybe the next time I come visit, we'll be doing a lot more. Uh, but, uh, but yes, that is right. We're putting nurses in, in hospitals. And of course, that's the greatest need.
need at the moment. So well, yeah, no, absolutely. That's why I, I wanted to just clarify that because I mean, I think we've all heard about the nursing shortage, you know, I mean, there's a lot of clinician shortages depending on which specialty they're in. But I mean, I think nationwide, I mean, there has definitely been a, a call out to the fact that there, there is a shortage of nurses. You know, I want to ask too, so you had mentioned the fact that what you guys try to do with your model is, you know, you try to fill the staffing need first and foremost with somebody who's well qualified, who's credentialed, who, you know, fits the bill as far as the, the actual um, clinical need goes. But then within that, you know, the business around the healthcare, right, it's, is, you know, you said you're, you're trying to provide the clinician with better pay, but the hospital system with reduced costs. So how does that work exactly, especially yeah. if you guys are sitting in the middle and you've got to take a cut. So I mean, to explain yeah. your business model to us so we can understand that. Well, I assume I can't get away with just saying magic. Uh, <laughs> I will explain it. Um, so and this is a classic technology operating leverage story, right? So the, the status quo that we came into was a market that experienced extremely high friction and also um, you know, had very inefficient uh, processes, namely processes driven by people. And so um, the cost to place somebody on, find and place somebody on an assignment is very high when you're doing it all with people. But much of what those people do in a traditional agency can be automated. It's highly structured, repeatable work. And so we've built technology, that's, the, that's our secret sauce, is to um, manage a lot of the work or automate a lot of the work that is traditionally done by other people. What that means is our overhead cost is substantially less than a traditional agency, which will allow us to offer lower pay, lower cost to the hospital, and at the same time offer higher pay. So imagine a, a simple, uh, you know, a simple math, which the flow of funds in this business is quite simple. Hospital pays nomad, nomad pays a uh, clinician and keeps a little bit for itself. Okay. The piece that we, and that's the same way that a traditional agency works, sure. but the piece that we keep for ourselves is less than the piece that a traditional agency has to keep in order to be a, you know, going concern. And so, um, what we're able to do is to uh, share some of those savings in the form of lower cost of the hospital and higher pay to the clinician. So that's how we do it. We you know, basically reduce the amount of people and cost inside of our system so that we don't have to uh, cover as much cost uh, and take more out of the total trend. I'm glad you explained the magic trick. There was nothing sinister in that. That was great. I mean, it's like, that's like, I think of how Carvana works, you know, and like the fact yeah. that it's like, they don't have to maintain like a giant dealership and like the electric bill to light it with a light post every like three feet. So, you know, there's a lot of savings that can be passed along to the consumer when that, when that happens. So that's very right. interesting. I love that. And I want to hear too, a little bit about about some of the stuff that you're automating with your tech because I like I this is like you know the, the overall like arc of all of the you know what's the future of health interviews is the fact that it's like technology is changing the way that we do healthcare and so it's interesting yeah. that even in the space that you're in which is like workforce management staffing it's like technology is being applied there and I don't know because not yeah. a subject matter is it has it ever been applied there before like tell us about like what's what are some of the things that your AI is automating that typically people are doing still right yeah. now in an office in a traditional staffing firm give us an example yeah. sure so I mean the the simple fact of the matter is, is that you would be shocked utterly shocked <laughs> at how this actually works sure um, I would so, be so tell us how bad it is Alexi <laughs> yeah I mean so um, in a nor in a you know sort of pre nomad world, um, let's take one piece of this uh, one piece of the puzzle here, which is finding. Uh, let's say I'm a nurse. Okay. Actually, I'm a doctor, and part of the reason I got into this is because I did the equivalent of, of uh, temporary work as a doctor, which is called locum tenens, and it's a, it's a very equivalent experience. Fun, uh, so let's say I am I'm a clinician looking for a job. I'm interested okay. in doing a temporary assignment. Uh, I want to you know go to the front line and help out where I'm needed. Okay. The process of finding that job is so crazy because not every agency has every job. No agency wants to tell you a lot of information about that job until you spend a lot of time telling them about yourself. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to, let's say, uh, 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 find a you know fi find a gig, I'd have to probably talk to five or six uh, agents uh, agencies. Um, in order to find maybe one or two jobs that are relevant to me and also that meet my needs in terms of timing and qualifications, et cetera. And so each of those five or six conversations will take about 20 minutes. And before they even tell me what's the name of the hospital, what's the shift, how much you'll get paid, they want to quiz you on 
what's your work history? Do you have this certification, that certification? Are you able to do this level of care or that level of care? And you're basically giving your whole bio before you're even, you know, even like I might not even want to have something. Yeah, right? I might not even so, want to do this. <laughs> and, and, and they're very opaque. Like they won't, they won't share this information outwardly easily. Okay. What we have done is completely eliminate the need for those sourcers and recruiters by uh, putting all of that information transparently in a searchable, totally open database of jobs. Sort of like when you look for a house to rent on Airbnb, you yeah. can find the one that's in the location you want, the price you want, the number of bedrooms you want, et cetera. We do the same thing. We say, okay, you're an ER nurse. Um, here, why don't you search for ER nursing jobs for, with the states that you have a license and that require the certifications that you have, et cetera. And then in minutes, literally minutes, you can see 50 jobs as opposed to uh, and, and find out how much you'll get paid, what the shifts are, et cetera. That eliminates the need for hundreds of people in our staff. <laughs> and so um, that is a one source of automation slash, you know, self-service, putting, you know, el eliminating a step of the process. That's amazing. And I love yeah. how, like the, the um, like how that empowers the clinician then to, you totally. know, to really find what they want to go and do. Like, I mean, I think that that's really, that's really interesting. That's it. And to me, like where this started, like that's mind boggling to me that like nobody ever did that before <laughs> and that there are still companies out there that don't do that. So, okay. So I get that. All right. I want to hear about how this worked in the pandemic because like the stats that i've read about your growth through the pandemic incredible i mean it was like 7x up the number of transactions on your marketplace it was mm -hmm. 5x revenue growth and you've already from what i read made as much money this year here right at the, right before the start of q4 as you made all of last year so talk to me about the pandemic and and what i would like to hear too is how your business is pandemic proof so mm -hmm. after this all goes away and there is no shortage of nurses on the front lines i need to go like how does nomad continue to grow and scale Scale and achieve these kinds of impressive financial results that yeah well so first of all obviously this is a business but we really think about the value that we're contributing to, to society and so we don't above revenue and above everything else we think about well how many clinicians do we put at the bedside how many patients can they take care of um, and you know over in 2020 we put patient we put clinicians at the bedside took care of over 300,000 patients we're uh, well on pace to take care of over a million patients this year that's how we think about our value. We are a very clinician-centric company. Everything is about helping providers so they can help their patients, right? We want to move all those, remove all those obstacles between mm -hmm. providers and their patients. Um, and so, what, uh, the thing about the obstacle is, is the thing about the situation is, if you remove the obstacles, you're able to scale in the way that you were necessary, you needed to do in the pandemic. And so. We were we had built a machine before we ever knew that there was going to be this crazy external shock um, that was meant to be able to handle that level of expansion in such a short amount of time. And so, for example, going back to the point about um, we don't have sourcers and recruiters. Yeah. Well, we don't we didn't need all of a sudden to hire seven times as many recruiters and sourcers um, to handle seven times as many inbound applications and phone calls because we just had a we had a website and a mobile app that were able to take in all of that information. And so that is, um, if, if anything, the pandemic didn't make our business, it just proved our business. And so um, it's been very, it's been a great boon uh, to, uh, to our business to, again, prove out the model, but also obviously drive people in. And so why is this pandemic proof? Well, yeah. the reason this is pandemic proof, I mean, obviously there's going to be some Hopefully, I, as, as a citizen of this country, as a member of human society, I hope that this uh, rapid, you know, this huge amount of need related to the pandemic goes away. But there's always going to be there for many, many, many years, this, you know, secular trend in the growing shortage of clinicians, there's always going to be this need for staffing. Um, and I think increasingly so because hospitals over the last, you know, year and a half, um, have realized that actually being able to have flexible staffing is very valuable uh, because of the you know ups and downs, the ebbs and flows of the demand curve. So I think the the things that are driving the shortage will continue. This you know sort of aging of the population, not fast enough growth of the supply side, and the increasing desire to use more flexible staffing will mean that this business will continue. This market will continue to grow. 
why it's been good, why the pandemic will you know, benefit us in the long run is, is that it's kind of like a one-way valve, right? People see that this is a better thing, you know, like it's a, it's a, uh, a better mousetrap. It's easier to use, it's more pleasant, but you know, better pay, lower cost, easier experience, what's not to love. So uh, the, the pandemic has in many ways been kind of like free growth marketing. People became aware on both sides of the marketplace, hospitals and clinicians, you know, the nurses, um, became aware of us, came to us, started using us, liked us, and will continue even after the last day of COVID uh, passes. Okay, so this is really to me like then it's like a redistribution of healthcare resources story. Like, I mean, when I hear it, it's just like, you know, even as you talk about what's next after the pandemic, it's like, play that out for us then. Like, it's like, how does this, you know, as you guys grow and scale and the years go by and we do get past COVID eventually, um, you know, it's like, how does this help shape the way that healthcare looks in the future? Because it's like, you know, you guys are providing like, really like, I mean, on demand, just in time clinicians, when, when a facility Facility needs them. It's like, how does this end up shaking out in terms of long-term impact on healthcare costs or long-term impact on like just, you know, making sure that there is the right, the right resource there to take care of people when we need them. Like, tell me about like the, what the future, the long-term future really looks like here. Yeah. Well, I, you know, COVID has, has chastened all of us uh, when it comes to making predictions, but, um, but, you know, I think, there are a couple of things that that do seem to be changing um, uh, as a result of this experience that the the world has had over the last couple of years. Um, one I mentioned just a moment ago, which is I think there's going to be an increased desire to use flexible staffing, yeah. um, especially given the fact that there is such a shortage. Um, when when you're when everyone is trying to staff to their maximum need for all time with permanent staff, it exacerbates the shortage even more. So if you can sort of pull back on some of that and rely on uh, reliable staffing in a pinch and, and your short-term staffing, um, then you can really, really, um, you know, sort of reimagine the way that, that you ensure that you have the right clinical staff taking care of your patients. So I think that's, you know, that's one thing. If you, if you can create you know, if you can make the a staff arrival on site as reliable as turning on, you know, water uh, yeah. from your tap, then, then, uh, you know, you would, you as a hospital administrator might think differently about how you want to staff your hospital. That's what we're, what we're driving towards. Um, so I think that's one, one big change in, uh, one big change in the future. Um, the other thing to, to point out is just sort of a more near to medium term thing, even though COVID will end, hopefully, um, the hangover from it is going to be very, very long. Uh, there is uh, obviously a lot of pent up demand, un unmet needs, so all these elective surgeries and things that didn't right. happen, care that didn't get uh, delivered in the period of however long the pandemic is, will have to work its way through the system. And then you also have all this, this absolutely horrible burnout crisis of people who are, you know, they, they, they've been overworked. They're either taking time off or just leaving the profession altogether. And so the need for, you know, temporary coverage is going to persist many, 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 many months and probably years uh, after after the pandemic is over. But I, I do want to sorry, I'll stop there. <laughs> I was going to ask you a question. I was going to ask you too, you know, one of the other things like, you know, you talk about the pandemic hangover and I feel like, you know, one of the overwhelming moments of sobriety in the hangover of, of COVID is going to be about um, state licensing. And you know what I mean? I think we're already starting to feel that um, thought like, you know, pop up into our consciousness collectively, especially in health tech, because a lot of, you know, I mean, the same way I, I you know, challenged you a little bit and talking about how your business is pandemic proof, you know, how does it not scale back down when, you know, the need isn't there to find, you know, nurses to work the front lines and hospitals that are surging. It's like, there's that same question asked often to virtual care companies, you know, like what's going to happen to telehealth? And it's like, so many of these businesses rely on the fact that people can practice across state lines now as a result of, you know, those restrictions being lifted through COVID. And we're already starting to talk about what happens when those restrictions get put back into place. How does that impact Nomad? Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, this pandemic revealed so many of the weaknesses of our, of our healthcare system writ large. Uh, <laughs> one of those areas is around uh, regulations like state licensing, the need for a clinician to have the license of the state where they are physically seeing the patient is an outdated notion in this very mobile world that we, in, in virtual world that we live in. Um, and so, you know, I think, if you if you sum up all of those things, everyone realized that 
you know, we, are, we don't have an intentionally di designed healthcare system, which means that it cannot react appropriately to, uh, to you know, shocks <laughs> like COVID or even just like the, the normal changes, you know, we're not, we're not, you know, effectively, efficiently managing the distribution of our healthcare resources. Historically, our answer is, well, we'll just spend more. And that's why the percentage of the GDP of, uh, that, that healthcare comprises has gone up year on year on year on year. There is a, eventually a limit to that. And so we need to be willing to make some intentional choices around, for example, uh, limit, you know, eliminating this need for state to state licensure or some of these other regulations like you know, the uh, telehealth, the ones that positively impacted, uh, the lifting of them positively impacted telehealth. We're gonna have to be comfortable not only uh, persisting those changes, but making more changes in a global context, global to the United States or even the whole world, so that we actually can allocate our healthcare resources uh, more intelligently. And you know, they are they are limited, and um, and we're not doing a very very good job, uh, with, you know, with with allocating them now. All right. Speaking of allocating, you want to talk about how you're going to allocate this uh, new $63 million that you just raised? I want to hear about that. I want to hear about the funding. So Adam Street Partner, like I said, led, but you've got your existing investors back. Can you shout, shout out the existing investors for me real quick? And then let's talk about what's next. All right. So yeah. who's, who's right? Who came back? Like, give us that first. Well, I mean, the exciting thing is that literally everybody came back. Um, everyone's very, uh, very supportive of the business from our earliest, literally our first investors till um, till this, you know, obviously our new investors, every single one re-upped in this round um, because they believe that we're solving a, a really important problem really well. Um, so um, first round, RRE, uh, 406 Ventures, Polaris Partners, um, Icon Ventures, um, Silicon Valley Bank, um, yeah. and then of course uh, Ad Adam Street Partners, and, uh, and 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 many others. Um, and so the um, uh, you know we're, we're we're so excited to have this level of support behind us. Um, ultimately, the way we're doing, well, the way we're allocating the funds is we just need to do a lot more of what we have been doing. We found a formula that works and now we're just in scale mode. We're in hyper growth mode. Those numbers you you quoted are, are exactly right. How do you support 7X growth? Well, you just need to invest behind it more. That means we are hiring all across our company, all across the country um, and, uh, and trying to build more products, you know, provide more support to our clinicians. Um, this is really, how can we, you know, make more of these better mousetraps? Ask this, is there any plan for you guys to move into the virtual care space? Because it's like, I see your model, you've got access to all these clinicians. And I know right now the model is put, you know, put warm bodies in front of warm bodies and actual physical, you know, um, places of care. But I mean, like, do, do you guys, you know, evolve into like providing virtual care services? Like what, what do you guys yeah. think about that? Maybe on the horizon, maybe not. <laughs> Well, so so the answer is it's certainly a possibility, but um, what, the way we think about our business is the uh, we are a very clinician focused business, as I said earlier, and so our whole thing is about um, providing an outstanding experience for clinicians and becoming the career management tool for them, the workforce management tool for the the organizations that need their services, need their skills, and so we are ultimately agnostic as to who is purchasing those services. Today, we focus on hospitals and send them nurses. Over time, it can be different types of clinicians to different types of customers, for example, virtual care companies. Um, but really, we want to focus on um, uh, supporting, sustaining, enhancing the healthcare workforce and to become the workforce management platform um, uh, of, of healthcare. I love it. The workforce management platform of healthcare. Is there one right now that anybody's using? Is there like a leader? Oh, no, and that's the problem. I just think, I mean, if you think about it, um, everyone talks about well, what's the product that you deliver? Uh, in healthcare, the product is care. And who who is the product team? It's the doctors <laughs> and nurses and allied health professionals. And the fact that there is no intentional management of this group of people who steward one and a half trillion dollars of cost in the United States every year is beyond uh, believable. And so um, there is there's no centralization standardization um, around this data, around these people, around uh, the provision of those resources. And so uh, the short answer to your question is no, no such platform exists. Should there be one? Yes, we hope to be it. 
you hope to be it. I love that. And I love this whole data idea. Imagine what we could learn about the healthcare workforce if only we had some data. I mean, I'm sure you guys have a lot of data on the 150,000 clinicians you've already got in your system. Share anything yeah. about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, so absolutely data is an extraordinarily important part of our own thesis on the market. Um, but generally speaking, it's just bringing the concept of data analysis to workforce in healthcare is, um, is I don't wanna call it revolutionary, but it is a big step forward, right? Because it's amazing how little uh, we use the huge, we healthcare use the huge amount of data that we have about the, about the workforce. It's because that data is not centrally stored, not organized, not translatable across you know, time and space. And so um, that's a huge part of how we're trying to uh, approach, uh, you know, uh, approach the, uh, the business. We do have, you know, tens of millions of data points um, and, and they, they provide a lot of very useful insights and, and some that are, you know, seemingly obvious, but not really acted upon in the, in the general, you know, workforce environment in healthcare. And so we, we endeavor to, um, to bring the power of that data um, to, uh, to, our, to our customers and to our users. Alexi, that's awesome. I mean, this is so great. I mean, $63 million. We started there. We started just talking on-demand healthcare staffing, and now we're talking about the healthcare workforce management system of the future. I love this. I love this plan. This sounds great. <laughs> well, I hope we can achieve it. We're going to keep our blinders on, try to focus and solve the staffing uh, marketplace problem, and, and, then, uh, and then build from there. But we're very excited about the opportunity and uh, really uh, pleased that we can you know, make a positive impact in the world. We felt it more in these last 18, 19 months than ever before. This is so cool. You'll have to check in with us and let us know how things are going. We want to hear about want to hear about your big Q4 and all the other stuff that you've got planned for the top of the year as you guys start to deploy this capital. Congratulations again on the raise. I seriously, very impressive. And congratulations again on all of the great results that you guys have seen through the pandemic and that you will continue to see beyond. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Jess. It's been a lot of fun and uh, I look forward to talking again. Good. All right. Alexi Nazem, he's the co-founder and CEO of Nomad, and we are celebrating his big $63 million raise. Congratulations again. I'm Jessica DeMassa. You can check out more interviews with the who's who of health tech as they are changing the way that we do healthcare over there on my YouTube channel. It is youtube.com slash WTF health, or just simply hit subscribe below. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye, Alexi. Thanks.